The next speaker that we have is Sam Partee, and he said, hey, why don't we use my term from last year, which was curiosity, because that definitely fits you, Sam. Um, but we decided to use something uh, different, which is exciting, especially because before, just one year ago, he was explaining uh, vector search to people, and now he's done that over and over again for lots of different companies. Just the progress that can be made in one year in this field is, is really astonishing with it being so dynamic. So please welcome to the stage Sam Partee from Redis. Well, hi, my name is Sam Partee. I work at Redis, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the different um, sides of the things that people have talked a little bit about today, um, but really I'm going to try to cut to a lot of the substance and just stuff that's going to help you do it. Um, so I'm going to try to get to the practical really quickly. Um, but first, I want to ask a completely impractical question, which is, who here is a Swifty, also known as a Taylor Swift fan? Well, it's kind of the understatement of the year. There is a lot of hype in this space. And if the hype even comes close to who crashed Ticketmaster, then it's, <laughs> there's a lot of hype. And so that's what I mean. You know, there's a lot of talk about the space, and especially around LLMs. But really, you know, getting to something useful isn't always that easy. Um, and so really, what I mean by trying to cut down on the hype, I'm just going to share some of the design patterns we've implemented some of the context that we've shown, and then some of the examples, and really just try to boil that down so that you can get something practical out of this talk. Okay, so really quickly, since I know other people that know more about large language models than me have covered this, like Sebastian, um, but everybody knows that there's a bunch of different providers right now, and that everybody is putting out some form of some large language model, and they can be used for all types of things, from translation to Q&A. They're extremely versatile tools, and right now, they're causing a lot of new and you know, different types of applications to be produced. But it's not all you know, sunshine and rainbows. There's a lot, of, a lot of different things that, you know, even though this space has moved a lot of different things along really quickly, like Q&A applications for FAQs, this, um, partic these particular sets of problems right here, costs. What, what hardware are you putting it on? Are you hosting your own? Are you fine tuning? On what GPUs? On what platform? Um, quality. How can you be sure that they're not going to hallucinate? As in, say something they're not supposed to. Or say something to a user that they're not supposed to, even though they're supposed to know it. How can you be sure that the QPS of a model that has a QPS of something like five actually keeps up with your system? I mean, seriously, some of these models have a QPS of five, like five queries per second. And security, like I said earlier, maybe you need to subset who this large language model can actually talk to. How do you do these things? And so we talk about rethinking this data strategy. Okay, what's the goal? Well, a lot of the companies that we talk to, the goal is we want a private chat GPT. We want our own documents and we want a chat GPT that answers questions either for external or internal users, okay? And part of this is, well, do I fine tune that model? Well, what about the same infrastructure costs? Or what about safeguarding that data? What if I want it split between external and internal users? So I can't fine tune that same model. If I use the same model, then that parameters, the parameters inside that fine tuned model know things that they might share with the external users. So how do I you know, separate those two camps? Or do I just feed everything into the prompt? Because you know, we all know that in the prompt, we can put a, a couple of examples, and we can put some context, and usually it'll figure it out. But even if you have a 32K context window, that's not going to solve everything. So what I'm going to talk about today is the middle ground between these two, because we all know there's times and places for both of those things. And there's times and places where both of those things are actually better, like in the domain-specific problems that Jai was talking about or some of the other use cases today where people were talking about you know, editing your prompt. Well, this is that space where vector databases fit in, in general. And so I'll blitz over this because I think a lot of it has been talked about today. But I showed this graph last year, and I told Mark that I'd show it this year because I made it really small on my slide last year. And I told him that I'd show it again. But I give this example because this is essentially the operation that vector databases perform. What you see on the right there is a simplified 2D vector space. It's obviously oversimplified. But there's three semantic vectors. It's like today is a happy day, or no, what is it? It's, uh, yeah, today is a sunny day, that is a very happy person, that is a very happy dog, okay? And you can see that 
that is a very happy dog and that is a very happy person in that semantic space are very similar, right? Well, if we have a query vector, what we can do is we can say, how similar is this query vector, the green vector, to those other vectors? And this is no more complex in operation than what you're doing in fourth grade with SOHCAHTOA. You know, it's just the cosine angle between the two vectors, essentially, right? And so you're calculating that cosine similarity between those two vectors to say how similar they are. And that's why it's an extremely computationally cheap algorithm to do over a large number of vectors. And that's why you can do it on large quantities of vectors. And that's a really important part, point about what vector databases do. They can store a lot of these vectors and calculate the similarity very efficiently over a large number of them. So now that you understand the kind of operation that happens in it, right, this is essentially the workflow. Unstructured data, unstructured data into embeddings, embeddings then into the database. They get indexed into an ANN, KNN algorithm, something like HNSW if you're doing approximate nearest neighbors, or KNN if you're doing something like a flat index, which is like brute force exhaustive search. Well, you might already be using Redis for like PubSub or messaging or something, but what you might not know is that you can use Redis as your vector database as well. And so with the search and query capability, you can actually use the exact same data, the hashes or JSON data you've stored in Redis as vector data alongside your metadata, index them with HNSW or KNN, and directly query them using the Redis search syntax. And my team is responsible for this ecosystem, <laughs> the, the horizontal bars. And so what we've been doing over the past year is integrating into Langchain. I'll talk a lot about that today. Making a purpose-built Python client called Redis VL. Integrating the vector capabilities as first-class first citizens in the 50-some languages that Redis supports. And making purpose-built data structures for those operations. You can see a lot of these different techniques are listed here, but I want to point out a couple that are actually really exciting to me. So right now, we're actually doing work um, on Langchain, Llama Index, working with partners like Mantium, Relevance, FeatureForm, and Metal, um, which are kind of like managed versions on top um, and really useful. Um, we're also working with NVIDIA such that you can start to put those same indices that you have in Redis on a GPU to speed up the QPS performance with their state-of-the-art indexes. They actually just released a paper on Kagra. You should definitely go read it. Um, and so that's a really exciting new development as well. But one thing I want to point out here is that even though a lot of the times, and I, I promised I would get to practical substance, um, a lot of times people talk about the flash, you know, like what Langchain can do, and they show a demo. It is really cool, and I'll show a demo that is just that later. But a lot of the enterprises, I'll tell you, that we go to and we talk about, they really don't care about that part. They care about the vertical bars. They care about management. How do I A, B, swap this out in real time? How do I create a temporary index over a subset of the data? How do I have multi-tenancy to separate out my customer data between two customer deployments? How do I observe that data with this 50 different observability tools we integrate with? Or do I provision it with Kubernetes? Do you have a Kubernetes operator? Those are the things that they care about. Where can I deploy it? And so even though this space is really cool, it's important to realize that a lot of what actually gets this done in enterprises is you know, the quote unquote boring stuff. And sorry, field team who does that stuff. But um, you know, it is, it's you know, how well does your Kubernetes operator handle a failover? Those kind of things really matter when you're going um, you know, to production and battle-tested software helps out with that. So now I'll get back to what do vector databases do for LLMs? Well, I don't know if you read this, but it's a Sequoia LLM survey. And it talks about retrieval in vector databases. And they, they said that 88%, and they might have a little bias here because of certain investment, but 88% uh, believe that a retrieval mechanism such as a vector database would remain a key part of their stack. And why is that? Well, because a lot of the problems that we mentioned earlier can be alleviated with a retrieval mechanism. Not entirely sometimes, but helped greatly. And I'll get into, that, get into why. There's three things um, particularly that we see right now. Expanding the memory like in conversations of LLMs, of a chatbot, so that you can say, get me the last K relevant messages with a user. Then retrieval augmented generation is obviously the biggest one. Uh, being able to say, given some context, generate some information for me, whether it's an answer, answer to a question or you know, even some new information given that context. And then there's LLM caching or semantic caching, which is a really interesting area as well 
which we've seen a lot of people start to produce um, in their workloads to reduce the overall cost they're spending on LLMs. Because if you can cache something, then you don't have to go back to that LLM. And if you can do semantics, then you can have a wider range of what that cache actually goes and gets. And I'll explain that later. So first, let's start with the big one, retrieval augmented generation. There's a couple examples down there at the bottom, so feel free to go to those. Um, it, the Redis Ventures GitHub organization has all of my team's uh, various examples and whatnot, so feel free to go and check that out. I'm gonna take a sip of water. So what does RAG do? RAG, retrieval augmented generation, uses a vector database uh, as a knowledge base. It's essentially an external knowledge base for the model. And why is that important? Well, when you have information that you're retrieving as context, it's often important that you not just have the information in, in that prompt, but you have the relevant information. Because oftentimes when you ask a question or ask a, a large language model to, to produce something, if you include things other than just the relevant information, and you say that this context is relevant to either answer this question or what have you, the LLM will get confused and think that it needs to include that as some part of the generated answer or information. And so having relevant information is more important than having more information. And that's a very key point that retrieval augmented generation helps with. And there's some benefits to this, and again, I wanna point out that there's space and time for fine tuning. There's space and time for using the, the entire thing in the prompt. There are times when those things do better. But some of the times that I'm gonna go over them uh, for retrieval augmented generation actually really matter. So uh, cheaper and faster than fine tuning. This is true even though some domain specific problems really require fine tuning. And so you might have to in addition to doing reg, right? And that just happens on you know, a case by case basis. But it is cheaper, embeddings models are cheaper, and semantic search is a lot faster. And what I mean by that is you can have real-time updates too. So let's say you expect that knowledge that you want your LLM um, to have is updated in somewhat you know, real-time, or even near real-time. Say you're gonna be asking it about a sensor platform, okay, of a various set of machines. And you say, what's the recent loadout on you know, X machine? And it's gonna give you stale data if you're gonna fine tune it every time on that data. So instead a vector database can store real time information that gets updated in real time, and indexed in real time if you're using a real time data platform. And then again, sensitive data, this is another big one. So what we've seen a lot too is that we want this chat GPT, but we want this set of data to be over here and we want this set of data to be over here for internal and external, okay? But how do you fine tune a model on both of those and then separate it if it's already in the parameter set, you can't. But instead, what you can do is have role-based authentication control in a database. And that retrieval platform only retrieve things particular to that platform. And so you can have, in that case, an internal and external platform for this exact same model. And you can still fine tune that model and have it get better at answering that type of question without having your private data in that fine tuning set, if that makes sense. So, those are some various use cases for RAG, but this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. So you might have heard of RAG, you might not have heard of HIDE, hypothetical document embeddings. Essentially what hypothetical document embeddings do is when you say, okay, the user's query is less semantically similar to what I'm searching for than a fake answer. So think about that. An LLM, given a query, can generate, can be prompted to generate a fake answer, which you then use to search for the relevant information that you then feed back to an LLM to generate the right answer. The user never sees the fake answer, right? But in this case, there's a lot of different reasons why this performs better, and it's because of the properties of semantic search. The query is often not formed in the way that the relevant information is, because it's often a query and not a, you know, a sentence. And so, in this case, there's a lot of reasons that this improves the overall generated output, but yet this is really slow. It involves an extra LLM invocation. So it's really important that your retrieval be very fast, especially if you're doing multiple retrieval trips. The good news is that you can do this asynchronously with most platforms in tandem with your regular uh, generative search, your RAG search. 
And so in that case, you can then have both of them running. And if the first one doesn't return any context that's relevant because the query isn't very good, then you can have it say, okay, wait a little bit. Now we're gonna return the hide base results. And I'll show you an example of what this looks like. So this is a LLM hotel recommender. Kind of a silly example, but it's a, a data set of a bunch of hotel reviews, okay? And so in this case, I can have the user put in positive and negative qualities and then say, okay, go find me a hotel. Positive and negative qualities of a hotel, okay? And so in this case, if you gave semantic search the positive or negative qualities, right, it's gonna go search for those positive or negative qualities. But that's not what you really wanna search for if you're recommending a hotel, right? You wanna actually search for the opposite of the negative and the positive. And so what we do is we ask an LLM to create a fake review of the positive qualities and the opposite of the negative. And then you use the, that to create an embedding and semantically search over all of the reviews. Once you find the reviews f that are similar to that fake review that is LLM generated, then you generate, you ask another LLM to generate a recommendation. And so I'll show you what this looks like. Something like this, a little streamlit app. And so you say, okay, uh, I put in Nice amenities like a pool and a gym. Hopefully you can see that. Nice amenities like a pool and a gym. Um, and then I think I said mean staff, right? I don't know if this place has a pool and a gym, but I probably should have thought about that. Uh, <laughs> but they definitely don't have mean staff. Um, and so then you'll see that it's gonna go and it's gonna have that spinny wheel. And remember, this is kind of slow. It involves two LLM invocations, right? And I'm not using that dual asynchronous approach here. So this on, on you know, most occasions takes about five seconds, right? But if you're searching for a hotel, how often have you searched for a hotel and it's taken longer than 10 seconds to buffer the results? So there's a lot of different use cases where it's okay that it takes that long of a duration. So in this case, we put in that, and then here you can see that it finds a hotel called the Alexandrian, where the reviews mention that the staff is very nice, okay? Well, it didn't search for mean staff. It searched in that fake review for kind staff. And so now it mentions all the time in this review that there's, and you can see the reviews on the next one, super nice staff, there's a pool, there's a gym. It found all of the things the user actually wants, but if you search directly for what the user put in, you actually aren't gonna find anything relevant to what the user wants. And that's how Hyde and these types of approaches, given semantic search and RAG, can actually be really useful, and they have been for our customers. Next is semantic caching. This is another really big one, um, and especially uh, for Redis as it's kind of roots as a cache uh, with TTL and eviction and a lot of those other things that it's kind of had for a very long time. Um, you know, semantic caching is basically the process by which uh, it's traditional caching, but you're using semantic search to find the results. So I'll give you an example, right? Say you're searching, uh, you know, uh, it's a Q&A system for an FAQ, okay? and one user says, how do I use this device? And the next user says, how do I really use this device? It's the same question, right? But a, a traditional hash isn't gonna return the same answer because a hash has to be exactly the same. But semantically, you can define a threshold by which that answer is cached. And so what you can do is actually even pre-populate a bunch of those answers, okay? Um, and so I'll show an example of this later. Um, I wanna quickly get to, because I only know I have five minutes left, um, some of the new things that we're putting out that help you do all of the things that we've talked about, okay? The first one is the Redis Vector Library. It's a purpose-built Python client library that you can define your index schema, all of your metadata, all of your various pieces that you may need inside that index, and a YAML file, and pass it to about 10 lines of Python code, create, load vectors, have them vectorized for you, and start querying. And all of that in about 10 lines of Python. Now, you might ask, why didn't we just do this with Redis Pi? Well, Redis has about 17 different data structures and can do a million different things for your company. Well, you might not always want that if you're just using a vector database. This greatly simplifies that user experience. And it also helps us with, you know, our team with things like integrations into LangChain, so we only have to maintain one code base. Um, so you can pip install this today. You can try it out. The user guide is at redisvl.com. Um, what's really cool about this is actually some of the things and features that we put in. This one's a filter expression language. So you can see here we can use all of that defined metadata on the left, things like credit score job, like text fields, tag fields, numeric fields, and we can use all of the features of the Redis search capability like fuzzy matching, wildcards, all of that in tandem 
with our vector search. You can also combine these like SQL expressions by saying and or or. And so you can have really complex expressions that are used directly with either range or vector queries. This is an example of the semantic cache actually built directly into Redis VL. You don't need to know how to use it. It uses a cheap hugging face model, so the embeddings aren't expensive. And then you can just say cache.store and cache.search. You set your threshold. In this case, I've searched for <laughs> what is the meaning of life, and then I search for what really is the meaning of life. It's the same question. It returns the same answer, right? Well, the threshold in this case for semantic similarity is 0.9, and instead of taking uh, the, you know, I forget how long the actual LLM took, but it was a 97% speed up. And the answer is because semantic search is a lot computationally cheaper, as I mentioned earlier, than an LLM is. And I know I don't have much time, so I gotta blitz through a couple other things. We also put this in a lang chain, which is really cool. So now anytime you use any lang chain app, you can use this same filter expression language. So you can use this combinatoric variant of all of the different Redis filters and use them in your favorite LangChain implementation. And so all of that same information with the schema that you can define that we did in Redis Vector Library, you can now also do in LangChain. And we're gonna do that for Llama Index, we're gonna do that for every single integration. And we're gonna get through a lot of them in the next three months, because we're pouring on the gas. LangChain feature example, really quickly, I know I don't have a lot of time, but this one uses the archive data loader and shows you about the automatic metadata indexing feature. So here we pull directly from, I know you might not be able to see that, but here we pull directly from archive, we chunk into documents, this hopefully sounds familiar, we index them into Redis. Notice, at this point I haven't said anything about metadata, right? All I did was say load all the metadata from archive, and yet, all of that metadata is actually using the Redis VL CLI, which comes when you pip install Redis VL. All of that metadata is automatically figured out and indexed into Redis as a tag, text, numeric, geographic, yeah, even geographic radius, um, or vector type automatically into Redis now. So even if you use any of the data loaders and you have that metadata, it'll automatically be indexed and ready to use with all of those various filter expressions down at the bottom, like filtering archive papers by category and year, and then you can immediately hybrid search them. The results of this are, you can see, we filtered by 2023 papers that are in the CSLG category that have to do with retrieval augmented generation, and they're all uh, you know, in that subset. And so this allows you to get really specific, really quickly, with a very simple syntax. How do you get started? You can go to Redis VL, you can look at the Langchain documentation and the Redis VL documentation, or you can just hit me up on Twitter or LinkedIn or what have you and start asking me questions. For the slides and the talk, I usually post them on Parti.io, like, you know, probably 10 days or so um, afterwards. And thanks to Mark and all the conference organizers. We love this conference, so thank you very much. Awesome.